I hereby call to order this regularly scheduled meeting of the Sunderland Select Board. The time is 6.30 p.m. Our first order of business will be to approve the minutes of our last meeting on June 17th. I motion we approve the June 17th minutes. Excuse me. Second. You have a motion made and seconded to approve the minutes of June 17th. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Three nothing. Yes. Okay. All righty. Our first order of new business is the Sunderland Elementary School roof solar discussion. Thank you for joining us today. Yeah. Online, we have Beth Greenblatt, who uh, has been our consultant on solar since before I got here, so no, <laughs> knows more than I do. Um, so uh, I know that there was some discussion at the last meeting um, because we're looking at replacing the roof at the elementary school. Um, how we might, if we might be able to put solar on the roof and what we might have to do to prepare for that. So um, at that meeting, we, we had some questions and we thought it would be worth bringing Beth in to hopefully help answer some of your questions. Wonderful. Thank you for joining us today, Beth. Pleasure to meet you folks. Um, Aaron and I, I, I know Aaron's on the call and I spent some time talking about this. I've worked with Aaron in the past for many, many years as we were working toward the first major solar project at the elementary school. So I, I'd like to just at a very high level sort of juxtapose the sort of the difference between what's technically possible and what's feasible from an environmental and utility infrastructure perspective, because I think those are going to be some of the challenges. And just not to be a revisionist, but just to give a little bit of history, and I'm sure Aaron has done a fabulous job of doing that as well. When we first looked at integrating solar into the town's portfolio, we looked at several locations, and we went out to bid, hoping to achieve success at various locations. And at the elementary school, we looked at various areas on that school campus. At the time, there was some concern about the roof because of a prior catastrophic incident. Um, and so we really shied away from the roof at that point for, for those reasons. But we looked at other ground-mounted areas as well as a carport structure over the parking lot. And there were several considerations that um, we needed to work through as part of any evaluation in that area. So for example, um, as you know, the area of the elementary school just south of where the current array is, along the drive, there's a lovely little green area that's surrounded by some wetlands. Um, we looked at that as a potential additional area for solar. We also, as I mentioned, looked at carport installations to see if those were feasible. Ultimately, what happened was we settled on a solar array size at about 300 kW AC in the area where the solar array is currently located. And because of utility interconnection issues and costs, we ended up having to downsize the system to 220 kW AC, which is a pretty significantly smaller project. And yet we were able to keep it economically viable. But it's, it was a, 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 you know, a, a sizable enough difference. Um, the, the issue about utility interconnection, and I don't, I'm not here to dissuade you from looking at different options, but the issues about utility interconnection is that Eversource West, formerly Western Mass Electric Company, is a small utility with small loads and long lines. And that, that actually creates challenges for distributed generation because what the utility does when they evaluate whether or not you can plug an asset into the grid, even if it goes through a building, is the relationship between energy in and energy out in general on their grid. And the upgrades that are required to ensure that the grid remains viable, reliable, and and operation. And so those are those are the things that Eversource looks at when they're looking at these types of distributed generation energy that's being fed to them um, and how that impacts the overall distribution network. So I took the liberty after talking, I think first to Aaron and then to Jeff, I took the liberty of reaching out to your current the current owner of the solar array at Sunderland Elementary School. 
just to see if they had any any thoughts about ways to expand the footprint there. And so the, the typical first questions come up, which is, do they have the capacity to absorb more solar energy? And right now, Sunderland Elementary School is absorbing um, as much energy as it can from the solar array. And it's literally spinning that meter backwards. But it is, for the most part, but for maybe, because I monitor that for Jeff on an annual basis so that the town can properly uh, report to the Green Communities Program, uh, among other stakeholders in town. But for maybe two months of the year, in the winter, the, the asset is actually spinning electricity back to the grid. So it's going through the building, spinning the meter backwards, and there's generation that goes to the grid. And for that generation that goes to the grid, Eversource monetizes it based on the tariff, and they put financial credits on your bills. So not only is Sunderland Elementary School realizing the economic benefit of the solar, but other town accounts are also getting that benefit. So it's important to make sure that that doesn't go out of whack, where you're taking in more benefit than you can monetize on your bills. Because if you do, you're not really fully realizing the benefit. There are certain charges that you're always going to pay every source because of, of state regulation that will never go away. But for the most part, you're, you're, you're seeing savings month after month after month. So incrementally increasing the size of the solar array at Sunderland Elementary School can be accomplished under state regulation under certain conditions. So any asset that could be built there would have to be a completely separate asset from the existing one unless Kearsarge were to go back and try to increase the size of the array, which would create some challenges with respect to the incentive programs that that project is currently um, compensated under. But for the most part, if you put a rooftop array or another small ground mount somewhere, um, or potentially a carport, um, I, I will tell you that if you put a carport port in the parking lot, this was not viewed favorably then, I doubt it is now, but all those lovely trees that line the parking lot would have to go. And, and I'm sure that would not be a desirable outcome. Um, but unfortunately, that would have to be the case. So I don't see that as being overly viable. But if there were another opportunity at Sunderland Elementary School, if you were for some reason converting one of the ball fields or the air, you know, either the area in the back of the school or in the front of the school, you were willing to look at a larger scale ground mount, that might make an economically viable solution for consideration, um, depending on what the utility interconnection costs would be to basically plug that, that asset in to the building. Um, and it would be qualified as a brand new separate system, separate and distinct, it would still go behind the same building meter, but it would be measured differently, recorded differently, and compensated differently than the current project. Because the current project that you have at Sunderland Elementary School was actually qualified under one of the old solar incentive programs that was super attractive. The new program, a little less attractive, but provides more certainty because it's some of the market risks have been taken out of the program. Now, to the extent there's other locations in town that may be considered, you know, at one point we're looking at wastewater treatment, but I don't know what the status of that facility is. It's also a relatively small footprint and challenged by infrastructure that's there. But if there are other locations within town that you think could provide a viable solution, that may be something for consideration. Um, again, a lot of it will be determined based on interconnection costs. So I'll, I'll give you a sort of an interesting example. I'm working for the town of Deerfield, and finally after, we're probably in year three or four, um, the, we, we got to the other side for their, their landfill project. We got to the other side of the utility process, and don't quote me on the number, I could certainly look, but it's probably just to interconnect that project is in the you know four to $500,000 range. I mean, it's not insignificant. Um, now, that's a bigger project, it's two and a half megawatts, but if you were able to get scale, that helps offset 
some of those crazy costs to, to interconnect the facility to the to the building or to any or to the utility either way um, so well I, I know there's a desire to look at the elementary school and if the, the roof wall seems expansive to, to you folks and when you go to replace it it's probably exponentially expensive um, there's still some question as to whether or not there's reserve structural capacity in the roof, I think. I think when Aaron and I spoke, that would need to be assessed first. Do you really have the, can you put additional weight on that roof? Um, areas over like a cafeteria or an auditorium are generally a little bit more suspect just by the, the design of that structure, the way the, because they're usually atrium type facilities and may not have the, the type of support you need. Um, so it, it certainly could be assessed. Um, I guess this, this, the, the, then the next question is, if there were viable options at Sunderland Elementary School, how do you go about doing it? Well, the first is under the procurement that we issued because Sunderland Elementary School was a key area. One could make the argument, although absolutely subject to check by town council, one could make the argument that we might be able to use the original procurement and negotiate an expansion with Kearsarge if that was something the town was interested in doing and if Kearsarge is interested in pursuing that. Um, the alternative would be going back out to bid, which quite candidly, I, for small systems, depending on the ownership scenario you're contemplating, um, I'm sure Aaron has advised you that there are two different ways to make these things, projects happen. One is a third private party owns it and sells you the output. The second is the town owns it. The town borrows money and after the asset is operational, you would be eligible for a what's called a direct pay under the um, Inflation Reduction Act Investment Tax Credit portion, which made now available effectively a refund of quote, taxes um, to tax exempt entities so it's a it's almost a rebate but it's treated as a refund um, for for up to depending on certain metrics but it could be 30 percent of the cost of the installation so if the town was interested in owning the asset there may be an opportunity to get more competitive offers but for small third-party owned projects because of the transaction costs involved in these projects these days they've gotten very complicated particularly with utility interconnection um, you really need scale to interest anyone there is an option there is a, a program in the commonwealth that allows you to sole source um, it's an option i don't know if it's the most competitive option but it's an option where you can sole source to an entity to design, build, own, and operate a system. So really, depending on what the town's goals are, I'm certainly happy to help you folks pursue whatever you may be interested in. I will also say, since I name dropped the Deerfield projects, and they are a neighbor of yours, and a, and a, and a, and a friendly neighbor of yours, um, that project will have capacity um, as a community shared solar project to provide benefits to your taxpayers if desired. And I would not want to speak for the project owner who's next amp or for Casey Warren, but I'm sure there would be, you know, a very good opportunity to have available to your taxpayers the opportunity to, to get some benefits from solar from that asset as an alternative. It, and, and they may not be mutually exclusive. You may want to pursue that while you look at other opportunities for the town. So, <clears throat> Beth, I think it, it sounds to me like sort of our checklist is first we need to look at the existing roof and the plan for replacing it and making sure that if we wanted to put... So the genesis of this was the school needs a new roof can we put solar on it, right? So starting there, <clears throat> can the roof support it? That's an engineering project to determine. If the answer is yes, 
then would we go, would we work with you to help design the system and look at, you know, how many panels we're getting and how the size of it and then procure, the procurement would be with the company that's actually doing the installation or would we need to procure the design too? So if you were to do the roof, the yep. first thing you would do as you engage someone to do a design for the roof is to ensure that it has adequate reserve capacity and if most of these engineers will be able to determine what that it, what that requirement would be, but if not, I can certainly get you some some you know general rules of thumb depending on the type of roof surface and and whether it's going to be fastened or ballasted and that kind of stuff. My guess is it would be fastened. Um, so I could I could easily get you that information if you were then to build a roof that was solar ready, and I would encourage you to also include conduits that are stuffed up through the roof so that you're not putting penetrations in a roof that's brand new, if, if possible. But on any sloped roof, you're going to have penetrations because you're bolting them onto the roof, right? Um, and then what I would do, I am, I am not an engineer and I don't design systems. I can give you a sense of sort of generally what the size of that roof might be. But I think more importantly, what I would help you do is figure out a way to procure, depending on whether you wanted to own it, and do it as a design build in which appropriate procurement statute you should use or if you wanted to do it under a third party help you determine the path to the highest level of success whether it's going out to bid which i'm probably not going to recommend or maybe looking at the sole source option okay so thank you i guess sort of a clarifying question on that is um you you mentioned that um we're looking at the roof as a we don't want to put a new roof on top of this building that doesn't take solar into consideration only to find out five years down the line that maybe a new incentive program comes out or the town's energy use goes up dramatically and we have the capacity to absorb more solar and then go back to the roof and say oh wow we put, we put a roof on here that we now have to as you said drill a whole bunch of holes through and do a bunch of work on to make it viable for solar, um, it makes sense to, to you know to, to look at it at this stage. That's that's why we're having the conversation. So I guess the question is is that before we start even talking about designs or getting you know getting people in to look at whether the roof has capacity, if we went ahead and had a roof that was ready for this, if our if discussion was a year from now rather than today, we'd already gone ahead with it. We put a roof in that has metal poles sticking up and conduit running anywhere. Is it still worth at that point? doing a roof mounted solar system for our town or is all that work really just not worth it because what you're saying is um, I wouldn't recommend that anyways I would recommend going for another field mounted system or expanding the current system or that kind of thing because um, it, it doesn't make sense to go through all these steps if if the answer is even in a perfect world if you already had a roof like that I still wouldn't suggest you put it up there so that's kind of where I want to start rather than starting from the design should this even be something we are considering or is your recommendation, don't worry about the roof, that's not where I would put it anyways. That's sort of. Is that to me? Yeah, <laughs> or, or to you, to Darius, to Jeff, anyone. So let me, let me take a stab at it. If I, so I'm, I'm gonna try to sit in your seat and say, okay, I'm gonna make a major capital investment in a roof structure. And, and I would say, you know what, you have a geothermal system in one of your buildings, you may want to do another one in the future and convert this building to renewable electricity in part. You're still going to need a lot of grid power. And if you do that, you would want to integrate as much solar as you can. Right, so having a roof that can support the infrastructure if you're already replacing the roof, the additional cost to make sure that if any structural upgrades are needed, it's done at that time, will pay for itself well into the future. Maybe you'll never put solar on that roof, but it's been designed to, to handle solar thermal, solar PV, I and mean, it's been it's now been designed to handle the additional, it has reserve capacity for the additional weight. So I think that probably makes sense. Whether you need to stub up conduits, there's ways to get to that roof. They could come up the side of the building without having to do a big penetration through the roof. So there's ways around um, some of that, but having infrastructure in place, at least partially, does does provide you that optionality into the future. 
okay. for the vote. That would be my thought. That's really the crux of what I'm trying to get there is, 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 and that was what we were talking about last time, was we just want to make sure that when we put this roof in, we address whether or not it, it needs structural in, you know, improvements in order to be able to handle solar down the line. Because right now, sure, we have an oil system. We may have, as you said, a geothermal system in 10 years. Um, just in general, all the students are now using you know, Chromebooks in classroom, and, and all of a sudden new technology comes out, and now there's AI in the classroom, it's not that. We don't know what the energy needs are going to be like in the future. This is a 30-year roof we're talking about. I guarantee the energy needs in 30 years are going to be wildly different than they are today, and I just want to set ourselves up for success so we don't end up putting a roof on there that we have to drill a whole bunch of holes in at an additional cost in five years or 10 years or whatever it is. Um, so it sounds like you're saying that it is worth the squeeze to do a little bit of groundwork sorry, right now in terms of the capacity to carry additional load on the roof and making sure that the design at least takes into consideration, hey, we may want to do solar so that the, the, the engineer sitting down to design it doesn't, you know, just has that in the back of his head. I shouldn't do this because that's going to make it impossible to run that later. I, mean, I, should, I should put this, con and maybe we do end up deciding to run a whole bunch of conduit inside of it because it's an additional cost now, but it'll be four times as expensive or ten times as expensive to go back later and do that later on. Uh, but that's, again, that's why we're here, to figure all those things out. Crystal, do you have anything you want to? I do have a question. Um, and, and maybe I misheard you, but it, did you say that if we put a solar on that roof, it's behind the meter of the existing project? And, okay. No, think of it this way. You're, you'd have two feeds basically combining together and going behind the meter. So it will continue okay. to spin. But now, there is a way to put solar, like the ground mounted array could have instead been plugged directly into the grid. That could have happened. But it was more economically beneficial to spin the meter backwards, and for, for all parties, to spin the meter backwards at the elementary school. So technically, you could plug it right into the grid. And that would be something that they could look at, and it would be treated as a standalone system, just directly providing electricity to the grid, which gets monetized, and credits then get applied wherever they need to be applied. The other thing I, I didn't want to forget, and Aaron, I'm not sure if I mentioned this to you, um, so maybe a budget cycle ago, um, Jeff, you're probably more familiar with the state budgets than I am because you live within them so tightly. Um, there was a, about a $50 million fund to upgrade roofs, upgrade and replace roofs, particularly at schools, for in preparation for solar development. Um, the money was, as I understand, um, authorized or directed under the authority of DESE, which doesn't implement programs. They're a policy setting agency. And they were instructed legislatively to work with NSBA and, and Mass CEC, I believe, to, fought, to develop a program which would be a competitive program. Fifty million for roof replacement isn't a huge amount of money, and so how they distribute that, I don't know. But I don't believe that program's been put out into the field yet. So we just want to keep our. I mean, certainly if I get a sense of its implementation, I will let you know, Jeff. But. To the extent that there's money to help make these roofs solar ready, which includes a replacement, it, it certainly is something to, to consider. Dan, did you have anything you want to say? Can you just explain again what the options are with the existing vendor? So the option would be, right now, I'm not sure there's necessarily an additional option. We could certainly ask them to yeah. look at different areas of the school that would be acceptable to the town. So I, I think we just talked about, if you were thinking about the school, we talked about the, the parking lot, which I think would be problematic because of all the necessary tree removal. Right. I mean, with Unless, go ahead. I mean, with the with with the solar on the roof, is there is there an option where they could just lump it into theirs? Well, what they would do is they would develop a brand new project. Okay. 
and it would be subject, they couldn't just plug it in. They would yeah. have to apply for it connection okay, so it's and whatever source comes back with. I think probably an in, in interesting discussion may be, and, and Jeff, I'm, I'm happy, and if Aaron, you know, you want to participate as well, we may be able to set up a call with Eversource, with the right people at Eversource, which is no one that the town currently deal, works with, but, um, and have a conversation about sort of the capacity in the area to be able to absorb additional distributed generation. Okay, thank you. Can I? Yeah, Hi, Beth. Darius Manos, the superintendent. I, I want to make sure I understood you correctly that right now the elementary school is not using the amount of, is not using the full amount or anywhere near the full amount that's being generated by the solar field next to it. I mean, isn't that the most economical, isn't that what you want to do, is you want to put solar on the buildings that are using the power? If we're not, we're just building a solar field for the general public to save money for, in save energy and the other things, but it's not, um, you're not getting your, the most efficiency at it for the town that you want. You want, to put the, you want to put the solar on the buildings that are using it, and we're using the field next door. Is that, is that, is that a, am I correct when I heard you say that? No, and I apologize for any confusion. So the, the area next door to the building, um, where the solar array is, there's actually an underground conduit that runs from the solar array into your building. Right. And, and it back feeds your meter. So it is literally spinning the meter backwards at the elementary school. And, but the school can't absorb all of the generation that's coming from the solar at all times. Right, but I, 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 mean, I guess, so I guess my question is, is the school's consumption at any time greater than what the field can provide? I think she said just two months in the winter. Just two months during the winter when the, or the solar is generations down. So if I'm, if I'm right. hearing your question correctly, what you're asking is, basically, is this the right location, or it should, right. it be, it should it be on a different, just like the library or something like that. that? when we should be putting it at the treatment so, plant, as you said, or on this building, yeah. or, you know, that kind of So thing. I guess the, the extension question that is, is if we're running the meter backwards at the elementary school, and we, and we add more capacity, we're not going to get the same benefit as if it was a fresh installation without having solar there already, because we're already using that capacity, we would effectively be selling that just back to the grid. Maybe we're using it in other parts of the, t of the town, but and correct me if I'm wrong, what, what Darius is asking is, do you get the same benefit if you're selling it to Eversource and then using it at the library on top of the, the school, or if we just put it on top of the library, would that be more co economically feasible from a selling it back to the grid u usage kind of perspective? Does that sound? Yeah, that, that's like the you're buying the best stock with this, you know what yeah. I mean? Because certain, one of them, if you're consuming the energy, you're saving more money than per a kilowatt than if you're selling it back to the electric company. Just right, to make up right. some, some BS numbers, if, if every kilowatt we save at the elementary school saves $2, $2 on our bill, every kilowatt we sell back to the grid outside of that gets us a dollar, we're obviously, we're getting more bang for our buck by saving money on our bill than we are by selling it back to the thing. And so if what we're saying is we're already at capacity for our $2 valuation because we're already using all of the capacity of the school to use electricity that we can, is adding more capacity at a dollar on the other side worth it, or should we be looking at places like this, the library, or like the what we're, what we're plant, where we can get that two dollar per kilowatt, you know, capacity by by using it directly in that building? That if that's basically what I'm saying. Is, is right. you want to put, why don't you want to put full solar and everything and get everything off, off of you know um, you know uh, we want renewable resources that kind of thing. So, but my question is, the town has to make a decision about where the best where to put their money. Just because mm -hmm. you have a nice, a nice pretty roof doesn't mean you throw solar on it. But we have to investigate that. And that's what I, I was just wanted to be sure I understood this other part is, even if it can support the solar, it still comes to the question of whether or not you're getting the, the best bang for your buck on that investment. Yep. When right. you have a lot of other needs in town and such. And that's, that was and my I, question. And I think largely what we're hearing is that 2024, 2025, not necessarily, but 2045, 2030, we don't really know, and we're just trying to set ourselves up so that if the capacity does change, if the school entirely shifts from fossil fuels to geothermal, and maybe you know we add a 
an addition because we get state funding for something that we can't even think of today because who knows what it is. Um, I just don't want us to, to, be, to 15 years from now being like, man, if only we had thought ahead of time and put that extra $100,000 into the roof, we'd be saving a million dollars today. Um, that's, you know, and so I think, I think if we can get an idea when we do go engineering out to bid engineering wise for what it would cost difference to not think about solar at all versus putting in some of the underlying conduits and or infrastructure and or adding capacity to the load bearing part of it. Because if we're not talking about solar long term, hey, we don't have to do anything to that. We can just slap a new roof on and we're good to go. If it does mean that we have to add some extra structure over the, the um, gymnasium, for example, I want us to know about that now and make a decision now. And if there are grant funds available, even better. For that, yeah. And in fact, it might sound like if, if there are programs where if we say this is in preparation for solar, it might end up being cheaper for the town to, to put the roof on with the solar stuff added on if there's money for that. So certainly worth looking into. Um, and of course, just in general, the due diligence of um, we live in one world that needs, needs our help and we're doing everything we can to try to make our town as green as possible. Um, any other questions from the board? Anything else from our esteemed audience? Yeah. Aaron? One of the curious things about the elementary school, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Beth, is that because of the school session, the peak solar gain months are exactly the time when the school's not in session, so they're not using that energy. That's why the meter is running backwards to the extent that it is, and those credits are being apportioned to other buildings in town. But that's another reason for maybe thinking the school is not the best asset for placement of a solar array when the, the greatest solar gain is not the time when the school can use it. Um, yeah, that, that's generally correct. But where solar is really providing you a, a great deal of benefit is for whatever generation, and since we've had far less snow in the winter, um, during the winter months when the building is peaking, because all of the HVAC systems are running at full tilt, not only are you reducing the kilowatt hours that you require from the grid, but it is having an impact on reducing the demand, which is an expensive part of your electric bill. Um, the, the way the utility bills you for demand is the highest 15-minute peak in the month. So if the building is humming away, and the solar is not, so let's say the building is coming away at six o'clock at night because you're having a town meeting or something and everything is on, that's gonna set your 15 minute peak. But during the other periods, when the sun is out and the solar is working, we are definitely seeing some demand savings. And I, you know, I'm, I'm delighted to tell you that from the monitoring I've done with the system, it's been overperforming from its guaranteed values year over year over year. So it is definitely, doing a really good job at Sunderland Elementary School. The building is absorbing everything it can in real time. The only way to keep the rest of it on campus and feed it when the, when the sun isn't out would be to have paired it with battery storage, which is a, another whole issue in and of itself and requires real, some outdoor real estate and some other things. But um, for the most part, it's performing as, it's, as it should be and any exported generation, which I think, you know, your analogy of you get greater value by avoiding buying the kilowatt hour than getting the credit back from a utility. Behind what Wamiko, Eversource West, it's not as significant as behind Eversource East, you just by virtue of the rate structure, but there's still, you're avoiding not only all of the supply costs, but you're also avoiding the, the delivery charges which is, a, is, is an, you know, an added bonus. When you're selling it back to the utility, they're compensating you for that, but there are some components of it that aren't being compensated. So it's a little bit lower of what you're getting back from the utility than what you would be avoiding directly. So I, I agree, I mean, I think if your strategy was, let's look at the roof and see what the difference would be to put on a new roof that was solar ready versus one that was not, and what, what will it take to get solar ready, what those additional costs might be, would be beneficial to know, it's just a, it's a good data point for you to make a, a decision, and then maybe look at other parcels of land, and I know we had pursued this with, with Margaret Nardowitz when she was there, but 
things have changed maybe? Are there other parcels of land that would be good sites? And if so, treating them as a standalone system, again, you're putting renewable generation into the grid, it's really just like you're clipping a coupon. It's a financial transaction between you and the utility, ultimately. Great. Anyone else have anything before we wrap up this part? Wonderful. All right. Thank you very much, Beth. We really appreciate it. You added a whole lot of clarity to a bunch of different things. Um, made this a lot easier for us to figure out. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Darius. Thank you, everybody. Other questions? Bye-bye. Thanks, Beth. Have a great one. Aaron, before you sign off, um, I was going to mention the Energy Committee letter later on, but since you're here and you're part of the Energy Committee, I didn't know if you wanted to talk about it. Sure. Um, has the board seen the letter yet or not yet? Um, not yet. Okay. Um, as you might have been aware, at, uh, towards the end of March, Representative Natalie Blay had a program at the Sunderland Library together with the House Chair of the Joint Committee on Telecommunications, Utilities, and Energy, um, addressing various bills in the legislature pertaining to climate and energy. And at that meeting, and then later on, as reported in the Boston Globe, the climate bill currently before the legislature is reclassifying nuclear energy as a clean generation source uh, for reasons that uh, it's looked at upon as clean with respect to greenhouse gas emissions. Um, the Energy Committee had, has serious reservations about classifying nuclear energy as clean in any real sense, uh, aside from the narrow point of, of greenhouse gas emissions. And even that is somewhat questionable, given the way nuclear fuel is mined and processed. So we, won we wrote this letter to Representative Blaine expressing our concerns about that provision in the climate bill. Um, we do not see nuclear power as a clean source and should not be viewed as such. And we view that if nuclear power is looked upon as bolstering a, a, a greener, uh, friendlier climate source of energy, that that amounts to just kicking the can down the road because nobody has of yet figured out what to do with all the nuclear waste that these plants produce. They remain hazardous for a quarter million years. We don't know what to do with them. They are now in dry casks, which do not last that long. And um, we think this is a serious error to support nuclear power at a point when uh, we need to really look at how we can reduce our energy consumption and not just find ways of providing more electricity that have questionable uh, baggage attached to it. So that was our reason for writing our representative to express our committee's concern about this provision in the climate bill. Yeah, I don't think there was a, I just wanted to yep. make sure that the select board was aware. And no, I appreciate you bringing it to our attention. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Any questions or anything from? Yes, Peter. Uh, just a, a question in terms of process and in sense of what's the next step. Um, it seemed like the consensus was, or the consensus recommendation was to uh, find out uh, what the cost might be to make the roof sufficiently ready um, and so on. And so if that's the next step. That I assume involves hiring somebody and having money available to pay them to do some work, and so I'm just sort of like, so I'm not sure maybe there's some other next step. I just want to, you know, usually these things just like so you know, my, you got a whole chain of events, and you sort of have to, yeah. you know, just to keep the ball rolling on this, and uh, you know, how do we continue to move forward? Because I think this is very useful having this sort of discussion, and we may be repeating it few times it's you know we learn more and different options get either more favorable or less favorable and so on but to continue moving forward then it seems like some engineering studies got to be done well and in my head and feel free to correct me if I'm wrong but my head 
it wouldn't be a separate engineering study about just is this about solar stuff. It, it, it's when we go out to to get the engineering study for the project in general, which I'm assuming we're starting that process fairly soon because that's what the whole point of what we're talking about. Or we don't have money yet. That's the I don't know what the... You yeah. might have money. <laughs> anyway, so when money is procured to do so, my assumption was that we were just going to make part of the requirements of that engineering study be the, the, the question option of solar readiness. Option B. Uh, yeah. Part of the process. Right. Yeah. Part of the process. Um, which I guess then begs the question of how do we get from here to where we are to that point. Um, do, do you have a rough idea how much money we would need for those engineering... Um, rough guess, 30000 Okay. Um, so I guess the question comes to you. <laughs> What's that? Pull out the checkbook. Where's the money? You know? I just, I'm thinking of our last, our last rough, engineering project at the agenda. school. and <laughs> How they're the same amount to, to design a hole in the ground and a roof. But that's okay. Right, right, right. Um, sorry. Uh, so I think... The next thing on the agenda is we're going to be looking at ARPA funds, um, and we might have a little bit of ARPA funds left over because some of the projects, I was thinking about this just now, um, actually came in under what we expected them to. Um, so I can do some fine tuning, but we're getting towards the end of our ARPA money, so um, we might at least have enough to, to get started on something. Um, it's about the timeline of the project, right? So you could, the natural cycle would be the school would put in for a capital request for the next budget cycle, which would be to do the engineering portion of it with, you know, getting the engineering done to get the probable option. I mean, we have a roofer's estimate, which is as good as the paper is written on, you know, but just to give us a general idea about what to start to prepare for. Um, but at some point, trying to secure, like I said, you know, 30, around $30,000, I think it was a number, between 30 and 40, um, the engineering would cost. And then that will give us the information we need for, you know, how much work has to be done to mm -hmm. make it structurally sound for solar. Is it solar or do we even bother, you know, or, you know, that kind of thing. Um, or, and then also give us probable cost from, for the, uh, for the project itself. They go for the next level of funding, which is to replace the roof. Okay. So, originally, I was I was talking with Jeff on the side regarding well, if you had ARPA money left over and you wanted to get ahead on that, spend that. But then I'm coming tonight with another problem, so I shot myself <laughs> in the foot with that problem. So if you just not put the asbestos in the windows, man, we would be fine. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I mean, that was the original would have been a great idea. Yeah. If you had some little bit extra money there, you could have got started on that, or do. You can even do the engineering in two phases. One, you do the feasibility of that stuff, and then you do a final part of it if the engineers want to do that. Um, so it sounds like if we can make ARPA money, pull a little bit out of a couple of different pockets and find the ARPA money, we could do it between now and next spring. If not, the soonest we could appropriate money for it would be next town meeting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think the, the goal would be to have an estimate of probable cost for for the school to come with an actual capital project in the fall, right? That's the, the soonest. Yeah. Uh, well, not in the fall, sorry, in the, in the late winter. Um, which would mean we would have to complete the engineering fall December-ish. Right, that's why we're coming nice and early. So you would you'd yeah. get the capital in for, next, for the next capital budget, right. get the engineering done, Next, you know, next spring, so to speak, after town meeting, you know, get the engineering done instead of going to. Oh, I, I was saying if we could get the sooner. engineering done sooner, so that we have an estimate of probable cost for the next budget cycle, for a capital. Right. Well, in that case, you're going to have to find. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. So it sounds like one, either we can find some ARPA money to make that work, or we add a year to the project, but. It, you know, <laughs> that may end up being what it is because that's how politics works. Um, is that something we can use reserve fund money for, right? That would be a stretch. Um, I don't know. I could ask. Ask. Uh, the problem is, it's July 1st, so last year's reserve fund money is gone, yep. and we have a uh, whole year we, yeah, <laughs> for this we want reserve to start fund money into to, the to use. If only you uh, come last week. Last week, June. Last week, June. <laughs> um, no, that's a good point. Last <laughs> week. 
No, yeah, that, you make a good point. Um, let's let's see what what shakes out with the with the ARPA money, and we can re- reassess in two weeks. Aaron, did you have a comment? One of the things I was thinking about as Beth was talking is maybe it's time for the board to sit down with the Energy Committee and other interested parties and really think about long-range energy planning for the town, not just the school, but all of the town buildings. Because she mentioned, do we have the capacity to, to absorb more solar electricity? Right now, probably not, but what about the future? There's a big push within DOER and the Green Communities Program for electrification of buildings, and there's some funding for that. So we should think about what that would mean for each of the town buildings, and that might paint a different picture with regard to solar procurement in, in town. Indeed. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, that was, that was sort of the, the point we were trying to say is about today, yes, yeah, sure, we don't necessarily have a whole lot of capacity, but in 10 years, it could be twice the usage of what we have now. We don't Right, know. but when that oil boiler no longer is in commission and we choose to go electric at the grammar school with an electric boiler that would greatly increase the consumption exactly. at, you know yep. i mean it's brand new so obviously we're not looking at a today or tomorrow issue but but we like, have to likely within the lifespan of the roof though is, is sort of the well probably the roof and the boiler will go at the same time they're probably both about a 30-year <laughs> item, right? But we also don't, and not to be a dead horse, but we also don't know what state regulations and incentives are going to look like to replace Correct. that boiler before it's 30 years. It may be that in 10 <coughs> years from now, we're mandated by the state to replace things right. with electric. We don't know. But also, so looking at the, this is where I want to sit down with the energy committee, is that right now we're starting to put in the heat pumps Right, and so you know, in an offset that we're going to be having, we'll be able to use more electricity, less oil, less oil. Right, and the next problem that we need, we have in the middle here, is a building management system that can regulate these so that we can use peak energy efficiency of when we have to use the boiler when it's too cold and those heat pumps can't keep up. You know, um, that's the next step, and so we've kind of done it in reverse design. In the sense that we're getting trying to get the AC units in so that it's bearable during these kind of these hot stretches that we're now seeing more frequently. Um, we're very fortunate we got a school early this year, but we would have been in a normal year two weeks of some of the hottest temperatures we've had in a long time. So um, in those weeks, so that, I mean, I'm kind of saying that you're in the sense that that's one of the things that we need to do next is look at what kind of um, incentives are out there for a building management system um, to to be able to hook in the heat pumps and the oil um, furnace and all lighting and that kind of stuff could all be kind of tied into um, that and that will also lower our consumption. But I just want to kind of say that out loud because that's the next stop for that building, not the whole town, but right. in our planning. And that's a couple hundred thousand dollars for a building management system of that kind of capacity. I might be, maybe just be a hundred thousand, I might be over exaggerating, but I always like to exaggerate the impact. Huh. If it's two or three years from now, it, it, it could be a couple hundred thousand. You know, um, and just to respond to you, Aaron, I, I also echo your your desire, and and you know, I, I would love to see our two, two our select board and your committee get together to talk about this and talk about the future, um, to have a plan so that we, we aren't just guessing. We, we actually know what we want to do in the future. So um, that's something I'm sure that Jeff can c- communicate between the two boards and and make happen. Not to put words in his mouth or anything like that, but I'm sure we can make it happen. All right, any? In regards to getting money for engineering, you don't do that right now. We, right now, you know, like September, October, throw it on the agenda there and then kind of kick up. I mean, right now it's a terrible time to start a project of that kind of. Try to find an engineer right now that's free to take out and get there and put stuff yeah. anyway. So, right, but idea if Jeff comes up with the money, we probably got to jump on it. Right. <laughs> right. Well, I know, yeah. Sometimes you want to see how your year is going to play out. Before We'll, we'll see we'll see how the ARPA money falls out. If ARPA money doesn't materialize, then yeah, I agree with reserve money. I'd rather wait longer so we can have less of a year left if we do end up spending that money. Um, but yeah, let, let, let's, let's hope the ARPA money works out uh, before we go from there. Okay. 
Great. Anything else final before we move on from this subject? Going once, going twice. Sold. All right. Thank you, everybody. Uh, moving on to the other thing that you're here for, the uh, ARPA request for the Sunderland Elementary School window asbestos abatement. Do you want right, to give us yeah, a little so second? So to give the full review, um, I did share a document. Um, is it easy just to share that? Yeah. Only just because it allow you to keep the focus of how we got to where we are today, and if anybody cares who's watching, I love them to see. So we're looking, so uh, you've already agreed to pay to replace the windows on the, um, on the north side of the building. We've already done the, the south side of the building. And what we did, if looking at this, is that we did the base 22 windows for 91,000. We did two add alternates as part of the bid because we had to make sure we stayed under $120,000. Because um, that was kind of the, the, the number that we had talked about. So we got that in for, you get the product, you know, the bids came in, we were able to do both for 116. Okay, we put it out to bid, that's the bid cost there. We then we had to do asbestos testing. Our, this is what the good question will be, why didn't you know about this ahead of time? Um, it was the grand assumption that the, there was no asbestos in any of those windows. You know, having talked with people in the town, we had a window guy come as well, who would help us with what kind of windows to get and that kind of thing. Didn't believe there would be asbestos in the window that was put in during that time period. Um, but we had to do the testing and we're wrong. Um, and so the, the testing came in. Um, oh, you, you must be that PDF because the, the numbers changed. But the, yeah. the, the abatement for the asbestos is actually 47,483. Um, this is a document I sent to Jeff because it was reduced because they put in for bonding. They can't charge us twice for bonding on the project, so we pushed back and they were able to make the, the uh, able to make the, the changes to the price. So basically, so when we did the testing, five samples did come back. Um, I mean, four, four of the five samples came back um, containing asbestos, but according to the EPA, you must treat. If you get some positive hits on windows that were put in at the same time from the same lot of windows, you need to deem that they are all containing asbestos. And it's the actual black window glaze that has asbestos. Usually it's in the other parts of the window or that kind of stuff. So even where it was, um, most windows are not made that way. Apparently this is an eagle window that was still using asbestos when the town purchased that back. The other windows on the other side of the school are hella windows that don't use that. They use a different, I guess, whatever they, that's used for. I don't know if it's for flame or whatnot. Um, so we're, we have this cost, and we're, um, the school doesn't have any extra funds. Um, do you want to talk about the AG, or do you want to go to the I can, or you can. Right. The, there is one thing that, so, so I'm looking for help here. Um, obviously, the Arbor money was quickly labeled there to it. Um, I already feel there's some guilt here that we've already, the school has asked for its portion of Arbor money, so to speak, and um, I apologize for this um, this additional cost that we need to see coming. Um, there is a concern that this is, you know, it's $100,000 to the project, that this is a 50% of the, it's more than 25% increase, yeah. and whether or not that affects the bidding. Yeah, so, so without getting into too much detail, the people that you contact about um, construction procurement is the AG's office. The AG has a particular attorney um, who deals with this. She's on extended leave. Uh, so I've called the Inspector General's office. They haven't gotten back to me. Um, the Attorney General's office hasn't gotten back to me. I contacted our counsel who, at least in a brief conversation, seemed to think that the 25% was more of a guideline and not a hard and fast rule, um, but was 
seem to also think that we would need to go through procurement, so might need to do another emergency procurement. But would be able to go with this company through an emergency, and, and the emergency would be we need windows in by the time the students come back. The only other issue is that the company's already got the windows that we granted the award the bid to. We, I signed off on that, or you signed off, somebody signed off on that. I signed something, I forget what I'm signing or not. But they, I know we moved forward with the bid. They purchased the windows to install it. Right. So it, there's another layer here. You can't just take it back and say, we're going to rebid this thing with, with asbestos abatement in it. Can we bid the asbestos abatement separately? Or is that I think that the, that's an issue of timing. Okay. Um, it would be, we would have to assume that some of the bids would come in over 50,000 based on this. So we would have to go through a full procurement with, um, you know, several weeks to put it out and response you time. You say that, but schools do not have to do, do that. Schools are up to 100,000. Right, that's right. Have, uh, so we could do it as a school and not have to do that. We could get three quotes. Um, well, that would be a lot but, the bid included removal of the windows. So when you're removing the windows, that's when you're putting them in plastic bags and spraying them down and making them wet. And it's usually how asbestos removal is. You have to make a damp and then you have to put it in a sealed thing and then you have to dispose of it. So. And this may be a silly question, but the contractor who has the bid is qualified and yeah, they, they can do the abatement? Okay. For the asbestos. Okay. Um, so yeah, I mean, if we can, be fairly confident that we can move ahead without having to open up new procurement, whatever. Cool. Um, so this is for every every one of the windows, or right? at least to, to the, on the portion of, of this project. So those, you know, you know, going back, scrolling back up, the twenty-two, win the total thirty-three windows that we're doing, all of them have to be treated as they have asbestos. Okay. Now the ones on the other side have already been replaced. And replaced with the Pell model, it does not ask this. Right. So 33 of the other ones. Okay. So, but yeah, those, I don't know when we did the oh, contract. The additional ones, the alternative, those 11, are those containing asbestos <coughs> also? Um, yeah, they, they should yeah, be. I right? believe they all are considered. Right, but what I was wondering is if you pulled those out. I've already signed off that we're doing both at all. Okay. And yeah, yeah, there's some asbestos too. Right. Right. There. <laughs> right. But that's what I was wanting to say. Save money. Say. You're saying just don't do the. I don't want to get all of this. Use that money to help offset. Or if we do the 22 right now and then next year do the other 11. But yeah, I. I, I yeah. 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 Well, yeah. If that's it, just because it's. Chances are those ones, are. I mean, the other side of it is also that if, if they do actually have asbestos in them, I'd really rather our students not. You tested one, you tested one from each of those groups, right? Right. Yeah. And four of the five came back positive, so, yeah. Um, I, mean, I, I guess the bottom line is we don't really have a choice about fixing the asbestos. We have yeah. to. Oh, no, you know? right. Exactly. I was so, just wondering. Um, and, Jeff, you said that um, do we have enough ARPA money? We, we, I, we, yes. Okay. Um, <coughs> but that, it, that, yes, but bear <coughs> just enough, um, and I'm going to have to make sure. After I, I this, have to look, we, but I think after I think this, we have to fine tune to if, see what this Yeah, if this lost. was, um, I think at 47,000, if everything was as we anticipated, and like, I think I put 120 in for the windows, and it's only 116.9, so there's a couple thousand savings. So I think we will be able to, but we're going to be, I, I would be surprised if we had more than $10,000 left okay. after this. So, discussion from the board. Do we want to? Prove ARPA on this? Do how do we want to move well, forward? Well, I don't think we have a choice at this point. If we need it done by September, yeah, yeah. July. <laughs> well, that makes it easy for us. In that case, at this time, I would entertain a motion to approve the amount of forty-seven thousand four hundred and eighty, not up to forty-seven thousand five hundred. Does that sound like a little bit of wiggle room? Yeah. 
sixteen dollars and change a wiggle room. <laughs> <laughs> If it was, we had talked about this, we were concerned about falling short. If it does fall short, the school can try to find a few thousand dollars to come up with a difference. So we have, we have to do a lot of do, but do we want to say 50, though? I guess the question is, is up to 50, or do we want to? I mean, I know we're super close on the ARPA money, but. Yeah, but that, that just leaves more for. I mean, let's do 47.5, and. I mean, a bid has to. At some point, kind of stand for itself, right? That is fair. All right, so um, yeah, I would entertain a motion for to approve forty-seven thousand five hundred dollars of ARPA money to deal with the asbestos abatement. I motion we approve forty-seven thousand five hundred dollars to address the asbestos in the windows at the school. I second. All right, we have a motion made and seconded to appropriate forty-seven thousand five hundred dollars of ARPA money for the uh, asbestos abatement at the school. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Three nothing, Jeff. Thank you. And so I'll be in touch with Shelley about procurement stuff and how to move yeah, forward. Shelley had another contact or call okay. in Rose's office as well. She's going to be tomorrow morning. So we're trying again or something. So we're going to have to figure out other side out to make sure that we're legally doing it. Yep. Thank but you. at least the money is there when you get that all figured out. Thank you. My apologies again. All good. September's coming fast. Unless your summer job back, <laughs> unless your summer job 30 years ago was putting windows in, I think we're good. Yeah. Not your fault. All right. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Have a great one. Thank you very much. Next up is I don't know what did my thing. Marijuana host community agreement. Thank you. Uh, old business. Marijuana host community agreement update. Jeff. Yes. So um, we talked at the last meeting about the host community agreements and um, I spoke with council asked them to take the model host community agreement from the Cannabis Control Commission and amend it to um, include some of the things from our original host community agreement uh, I had a conversation uh, with her last week and I think the the only thing that we took out of here because it was redundant was the um, traffic study because council also had a copy of the um, special permit which has which references the traffic study every three six nine months I think or the first three six nine months um, so they said are you really gonna they said if you're comfortable with the ZBA and the zoning enforcement officer enforcing that, then you don't need it in the host community agreement. The fact that that might get it thrown out, I said fine. <laughs> if we can do it that yeah, way, no, let's yeah. not. Knowing that the the yeah. commission is already right. only approving ones that are their, you know, yep. their model, I would agree that we don't want to put anything in there that we don't have to. Yeah. Okay. So I mean, we we reserved the right to collect community impact fees if that becomes available. We asked that the retailer, before they renew for their license, they give us time so that we can find out if there are community impacts and submit those to them. Um, and then I think the third biggest was um, we asked that if we ask the police department to consult on security or traffic, that they do that. So those are sort of the three exceptions. Um, and if that all sounds good I, if you want a little bit more time to review it um, but the next step would be once we're comfortable with it sending it over to the establishment and having their attorneys look at it and I mean, I'm comfortable moving forward with it we've been discussing it all yeah. along any objection right. to no. No. Okay. Okay. do you want a motion or just to have consensus that we're no because you'll you'll vote to sign it when it's okay. final, okay. final. So. great thank you yep all right, uh, next up is select board updates. Um, I don't think I have anything other than just once again wishing Crystal a happy birthday. <laughs> happy birthday. <laughs> That's our job. That was last oh, week. Oh, last week. All right, well. Happy That's um, why I was happy that every other week someone went because it was last Monday. You thought you could, you thought you'd get away with it. Come on um, other than that, I don't have anything, Crystal? Um, nope, I got uh, South County EMS tomorrow, so. Maybe next time I'll actually have something. Wonderful. 
Dan? I'll just say quick, quick, you're thrilled we get the Mass Trails grant, and I'll let Jeff expand on that. Yeah, um, <laughs> we I got 196,000, uh, a match of, I think it was about 28,000, no, it was more than, it was, I think like 60,000, 25 of which is um, CPA funds, and the, it's to study the feasibility of a shared use path connecting the Waitley Park and Ride through Deerfield, over the river, through Sunderland, and then down up to Meadow Street, and we're hoping that at that point it will connect to a um, trail on the, I think it's the MassDOT Priority Trails map that has not been built, but is on the map for future development. So um, next steps is gonna be getting together with the towns, um, hiring a consultant to help us do the feasibility study um, and moving forward with that. But that, that, that was a, a really exciting award and a pretty big one too, I think, for, for design. Yeah, that's, is, great. Mm -hmm. that's great. Yeah. And, uh, so we worked, with, we worked with a consultant to help us with the grant application so they're preparing a scope and fee. For the work. Nice. Wonderful news. Thank you all for yeah. both for all the work you did. Yeah. Done that. Thanks, to, thanks to everybody. Four towns. Everybody, everybody puts some effort in, and uh, excited we get it done. Yeah, very exciting for yeah. us. Very exciting, not just for the Sunderland, but also for the whole middle Pioneer Valley region. Um, yeah, it's really it's great for all of us. All right, Jeff. Any other uh, town administrator updates? Uh, two things. Um, one. Move. A few months ago, I mentioned that we were going to go into cable negotiations at some point. Um, so I've learned, because uh, Waitley reached out, that tip in the past, Waitley, Deerfield, and Sunderland have jointly hired an attorney to negotiate with us because we all share FCAT and I guess in the past we've all basically had identical or nearly identical contracts. Um, so Waitley reached out said, are we interested in doing that again? I said, this is my first time going through it, so I'll, I'll take your lead, but I don't see why we wouldn't. It makes sense. So we're going to have, um, try and have an initial meeting just to help myself. And I don't, I don't know if um, Casey has been through this with Deerfield yet or not, but just make sure we're all on the same page, understand what's going on. Um, but it sounds like we may not need a cable advisory committee. I think Waitley just um, assigned a select board member to represent them in the negotiations. So um, I will keep you updated, but I wanted to share that. And then the second is uh, a piece of sad news. Um, long time uh, administrative assistant for the select board and the board of health Cindy Bennett has announced that she is resigning um, so thank you Cindy I <laughs> you're all uh, you're muted. I'm retiring oh I'm sorry <laughs> yes you are yeah, that's, <laughs> what, that's what I thought <laughs> <laughs> we weren't yeah. clapping because you know yeah, she's just out of here. It, no, it matters. She's retired. It, oh, it definitely <laughs> does matter. Life. You burned it. You burned it. Exactly. <laughs> very, very sad news for the town, but congratulations. We're all very happy yeah. for you, and uh, thank you for all the hard work that you've done all these years. We really. I'm jealous. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. <laughs> and the huge. I'm excited. So. I'm sure you are. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you, Cindy. Anything else, Jeff, from you? Nope. All right. At this time, pursuant to Mass General Law, Chapter 30A, Section 21A, Paragraph something or other. Oh, sorry. <laughs> paragraph 3. To, to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigating position of the public body, and the chair so declares. Police Union uh, v. Sunderland, Police Association v. Town of Sunderland, MUP 2020, oh, sorry, MUP 22-95033. Um, we will go into executive session. When the executive session is done, we will come back out of executive session into public session, at which point we will likely vote on what we were discussing in executive session, and then we will uh, adjourn from there. Do we want to give these important dates before we? Yeah. 
and yes, while we're still being recorded, uh, important dates. First of all, this Thursday is the 4th of July. Happy birthday, United States of America. Um, the offices will be closed in observation of Independence Day. And then our next meeting will be uh, Monday, July 15th, in two weeks from today, at our normal 6.30 time. All right. At this time, I would entertain a motion to enter, to adjourn and enter, er, enter, ent enter into executive session. I motion we enter executive session. Second. All right. We have a motion made and seconded to enter executive session. All those in favor? Uh, I, roll call vote. Sorry. Roll call. I, Crystal Drake Tremblay. I, Dan Murphy. I, Nathaniel Waring. 3 nothing. Thank you very much. And the time is 7.40.